Good morning, I'm Maddie Jansen, and this is the podcast of 17 News at Sunrise. It's everything you need to know to start your day in about 15 minutes. Working in the spirit of the Golden Empire, this is 17 News at Sunrise. It's official. The Bakersfield City Council has chosen a new site for a low barrier shelter. 17's Karen Wall was there as discussion stretched for several hours. We'll have details of the vote coming up. Friends and family gathered to remember the students stabbed near Foothill High School on Tuesday. What they're saying about the 17-year-old. And the Democrats have wrapped their first day of arguments against the president in only the third impeachment trial ever in our nation's history. We'll take you to the Senate floor and have response from the president's lawyers. This is Thursday, January 23rd, 2020. Good to have you with us. I'm Maddie Jansen alongside Alex Fisher. And we're taking a look at your forecast on this Thursday. And uh, not too bad of uh, weather forecast of the last couple of days. The sun has been out. It's been kind of above average, right, Kev? Almost definitely, yeah. Yesterday, 65 degrees. We had mostly sunny skies. So the normal for this time of year, 57. So up 8 degrees where we should be. The record, 76, set back in 1981. This morning, we're in the 40s. 44 degrees right now. Visibility is good at 9 miles. There's a little patchy fog out there. I did see it as I was driving in uh, south southeast wind at five miles per hour right now. We'll start out in the 40s and then look at that. We're back into those comfortable 60s under mostly sunny skies throughout the afternoon. To Hatchby right now sitting at a chilly 28 degrees. So definitely grab a jacket if you're headed out the door. Visibility at two miles. I uh, talked to Maddie this morning. She was coming in. There was no major issues in terms of fog in the to Hatchby area. So we'll get a better look at that coming up in just a little bit. We might see some low lying clouds, but for the most part, we'll be looking at sunny skies throughout the day and another mild day into the mountains as well with temperatures this afternoon right near 58. We'll talk more about your forecast in just a little bit, but first, let's see how the morning commute's going. We're going to sit out over to Alex. All right, Kev, thanks so much and taking you outside for the first time this morning. Here's a look at the 99 near Airport Drive, and as you can see, it's looking pretty good on that side of town. Uh, no major incidents to talk about right now, which is great news to start off your Thursday. Just keep in mind of all the construction projects around town and uh, give yourself a few extra minutes if you're headed out the door. There's now a new location for a low barrier homeless shelter in Bakersfield. The proposed locations for the shelter have been the subject of heated debate for months now. The meeting last night went on for nearly five hours as the council discussed the proposition. 17's Karen Wall was at the city council meeting last night as the vote narrowly passed. In this packed house, everyone agrees homelessness is a crisis in Kern County. The disagreement is where to put a new low barrier shelter. It will also provide them with the dignity of being able to bring along their pets, their possessions, their partners. The location up for vote? The current Calcott property on East Brundage Lane near Mount Vernon Avenue. It's seven acres and has space for 450 beds. It would include wraparound services like for mental health as well well as a Bakersfield police substation. Some believe this is a crucial step toward mitigating homelessness. It's cold, it's raining. The homeless people are hurting here in Bakersfield. We are at a crossroads in our community with the opportunity to address the crisis that we have in the right way and in a comprehensive manner, building a system-wide response for all that are experiencing homelessness. Others are flat out opposed to the location or the shelter altogether. Along with the homeless um, population comes a lot of mental illness, drug abuse, and crime. My concern is also the size, okay? Uh, I propose under 200 beds max. When we talk about adding a low barrier homeless shelter in a double digit unemployment community that's inhumane. You have just taken yet another stab at this community opportunity to thrive. Calcot's going to cost $7.2 million, and then you heard that it's going to be at a minimum 2 to $2.5 million a year to operate. You know, I'm obviously not in support of it. Ward 2 Council Member Andre Gonzalez ultimately made three proposals for vote. The purchase of the Calcot property passed narrowly, 4 to 3. Motion passes with Vice Mayor Parlier. Councilmember Rivera and Councilmember Sullivan voting no. Gonzalez also proposed a neighborhood improvement plan for the surrounding area, and he proposed a partnership with the county to tackle homelessness. Both passed. Motion is unanimously approved. The Calcott property is the only option that gives us shelter space, room for a day center, 
and offices for support providers to help people transition into housing and gives us capacity to grow in the future. That was 17's Karen Wall reporting. 505 now, a chemical leak in Taft prompted a massive emergency response and widespread evacuations. Those recommended evacuations were lifted last night. The call came in around 10 o'clock yesterday morning as a possible chemical leak at the Taft Manufacturing Company on South Lake Road. All 30 employees were evacuated. Anyone within a six-mile radius of the plant was also urged to leave. Kern County Fire, hazmat crews, and law enforcement officers all responded to the scene. The Office of Emergency Services says a large container that was shipped to Taft Manufacturing from overseas was received in leaking condition. About three hours after the initial call, KCFD found the source of the leak and stopped it. It was a product known as acrylion. Uh, this is an inhalant. It's a pesticide slash herbicide. And because of... Uh, the, the nature and risk that it does pose to health, uh, it was treated with an abundance of respect and caution. Acrylion can be toxic to humans and cause eye, nasal, and respiratory problems. The evacuation recommendation was lifted around 7 last night. A candlelight vigil was held for the student killed at Foothill High School during an after-school fight. A large crowd gathered outside the school to remember the 17-year-old. Friends described the student as respectful and loving. They said he wanted to do well in school and graduate. Tuesday's fight was captured in graphic images and videos that circulated social media pages. Images like this one. We altered it to protect the privacy of the victim. Here you can see a young man with a knife in his hand and covered in blood. In the background, a teen kneeling is covered in blood. And behind him, a third person bent over in the middle of the street. Deputies responded to the area around 2.30 Tuesday afternoon. The student died at the scene. Two more people were stabbed but survived and are now under arrest. They include 23-year-old Jason Cruz and a 14-year-old boy who was arrested on suspicion of assault with a deadly weapon. The name of the student that died has not been released. 507 now. The man charged in a crash that killed a nine-year-old boy is now suspected of drinking and driving. Police say Evaristo Nunez ran a stop sign in front of a car on Cottonwood Road. It happened January 7th. Nine-year-old Emiliano Hernandez was inside the car and he died. Three other children in the car were hurt in the crash. Court documents reveal a witness told police Nunez called him after the crash, adding Nunez ran away because he had been drinking beer. Officers found Nunez later and arrested him. He pleaded not guilty to a charge of vehicular manslaughter. 17 Court Watch now. Jurors in the Leslie Chance murder trial will begin their deliberations this morning. Closing arguments wrapped up yesterday, and 17's Vanessa Dillon has been in the courtroom and has more. You're an innocent person, and you're screaming from the top of your lungs, I didn't do this. Defense attorney Tony Lidget says it has been an excruciating process for Leslie Chance, the woman accused of killing her husband Todd Chance in 2013. This is an innocent person. She did not kill her husband. Lidget's argument came after prosecutors offered their closing arguments Tuesday. Prosecutor Arthur Norris walked the jury through evidence he believes points to Chance as Todd's killer. The things that the defendant did to prepare for this plan are absolutely evidence, not just of identity, but also of premeditation. Norris told jurors Chance killed her husband out of jealousy and for financial gain. For years, prosecutors argued Chance planned and carefully executed her husband's death to collect hundreds of thousands of dollars in life insurance policies. But now Norris says financial gain is a secondary motive. Prosecutors argue she killed him in a rage of jealousy after finding out he had been texting an old girlfriend. His behavior was completely inappropriate for a married man. That said, I don't think anybody would suggest that murder would be justifiable under those circumstances either. But on Wednesday, Lidget argued the prosecution's evidence is built entirely on assumptions. What was Janae's motive? They keep coming up. We knew this, we knew this, we knew this, then show it. Show it that she knew. 
Norris also argued multiple witnesses identified chance in surveillance video. But Lidget says that witness testimony comes from those who allegedly don't like chance. Norris said chance's fingerprints were found on Todd's black Ford Mustang, the vehicle prosecutors say chance killed her husband in. That was the defendant's fingerprint. It wasn't anybody else's. It wasn't Carrie Williams. It wasn't some crazy third party. It wasn't some other strange woman or anybody else. It was the defendant's fingerprint. Belligit argued the fingerprints lacked relevance in the case and went into detail of how detectives failed to disclose certain pieces of evidence. Prosecutors presented their rebuttal to Lidget's argument Wednesday afternoon. Belligit concluded his closing arguments earlier in the day by urging jurors to find Chance innocent. It's time for the nightmare to end. It's time for Janae to come home. I'm Vanessa Dillon, 17 News. And court resumes this morning at 9 a.m. with jurors set to begin deliberations. If Chance is found guilty, she faces life in prison. Well, still to come this morning on Sunrise, in need of blood donations for their newborn twins, a family reached out to the community. Yeah, the community certainly responded in a big way. How the babies are doing now and what the parents had to say to the donors. And we're getting closer to the weekend. What's our forecast looking like? I've got the details coming up right after the break. We're back here at 520. It's a Bakersfield tradition, 40 years in the making. This morning, the community will gather as the city hosts the annual prayer breakfast. And 17's Taylor Schaub is live this morning at the Bakersfield Convention Center with a preview. Taylor, it is going to be a busy morning. Maddie, Alex, yeah, it's going to be a really busy morning here. As you can see behind me, it's a sea of red, white, and blue. It's a really elaborate setup they have here for the 40th annual Bakersfield Prayer Breakfast. I'm going to step out of the shop real quick just to give you guys a look at the setup here. The annual tradition, it brings people together to pray for our community, state, and country. Everybody is invited regardless of their faith or political views. It's happening this morning at Bakersfield Convention Center. The keynote speaker this year is Rocky Fleming, founder of Influencers Global Ministries. It's a ministry focused on business culture, churches, prisons and jails, campuses as well as other cultures. Uh, this morning, those at the breakfast will hear how he went from an NFL career to a successful business career and now a life dedicated to helping people through the written word. Uh, this morning's breakfast will start at 640, promptly ending around 830. Uh, Fleming... We'll, and it, and we will have coverage all throughout the morning, live in uh, downtown Bakersfield. Taylor Schaub, 17 News. All right, Taylor. Yeah, we'll be out there all morning long. This is a big breakfast yeah, where so the many people. One in the nation. Yeah, it is, and a lot of people go out to it, so we'll have uh, coverage throughout the morning. All right, thanks, Taylor. 522 now. The parents of newborn twin girls desperately in need of blood donations had a chance to express gratitude to those donors. I really want to say thank you relatively normal pregnancy. So. An emotional Ruby Alatore and her husband were invited to Houchin Blood Bank yesterday. The couple got to meet some of the O negative blood donors who answered the call for help when their daughters Maya and Gloria were born. It was hard not to get emotional. Um, we thank them um, for coming out um, because they they didn't just help our babies. Um, I mean it helps a lot of a lot of other you know babies. The couple was also given two gift baskets, one for Maya and one for Gloria. The couple says the babies are doing well. Yeah, when a baby arrives that early, I mean, there's all the health concerns, but then you're not even ready. You haven't had a chance to have all of those showers and prepare and get the nursery ready. So, you know, they've the community has reached out to this family in so many ways, and it's so cool. Well, you know, and it can be such a stressful time, too, especially uh, when you have a preemie. And yeah. so uh, just to see everyone come together, as they always do here in Kern County, and help that family, I mean, it really it's is really heartwarming for sure. All right, 523, can you imagine paying $25,000 for a train ticket? All because you're in a wheelchair. All well, the backlash Amtrak is facing coming up after this. KGET Business Watch is brought to you by Grapevine MSP Technology Services, the Valley's leading IT service provider. 
Welcome back. Don't click on that link. That's what FedEx is telling consumers dealing with a text and email scam. The shipping retailer tweeted this alert out yesterday. It points to recent scams where people reported receiving texts and emails that appear to be from FedEx. The messages alert them that they have a package, then gives a link. FedEx says the messages are not from them. It's advising, quote, suspicious messages should be deleted without being opened. FedEx also says people should report the emails and texts to to them using the email abuse at FedEx.com. DirecTV has less than a month to remove a satellite from space that it says could explode. The company informed the FCC that one of its telecommunication satellites, like the one shown here, suffered damage to its battery. Boeing makes the satellite and, conclu- and concluded there is a risk the battery could burst because of the damage. If that does happen, it could take out other telecommunication satellites that are nearby. The FCC has granted DirecTV 30 days to take their satellite out of orbit and decommission it. DirecTV wants to make this happen before the start of the spring eclipse season on February 25th.